Okay, great. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Praskovia Bustrova, and uh, on behalf of Strategies Center for a New Economy, I'm glad to welcome you at the first presentation of Strategist New Report, Eastern Partnership Development Expert News. Before we start, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel and the order of today's presentation. We will start with the keynote speech by the president of Strategist Center, Anatoly Motkin, and we'll follow up with the Q&A session with our distinguished experts who have contributed to the creation of this analysis and the report. Mr. Kaha Gugulashvili, a senior fellow and director of European Studies Center at the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies, Georgia. Helene Alexanyan, an analyst at Inlight Public Research Center in Jo, Armenia. Artem Bidenko, head of the Institute of Information Security in Ukraine. Dr. Katerina Bornokova, Academic Director of Birok Economic Research Center, Belarus. And Shala Ismail, Chairwoman at Women's Association of for Rational Development, Azerbaijan. Thank you for joining us and um, willingness to, to share your perspectives today. Uh, dear partners and friends who joined the audience, if you would like to ask the panelists your questions, please send it over and we will have such possibility today. I'm passing the microphone to Anatoly Motkin, President of Strategy Center for the key note remarks. Anatoly, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Praskovia, and uh, thank you to our experts for a, a great job that you have done and they will have an um, uh, opportunity to present today. Uh, so with your permission, I'll uh, share with our audience uh, the presentation of the report and uh, then we'll be happy to hear your uh, takes uh, on what happens in our countries and the countries of uh, Eastern Partnership region. So with your permission, I'll share the... Um, in just a sec, uh, I need to share the, the screen. Do you see this? Yeah. Okay, so uh, why Eastern Partnership? So studying the processes of westernization in Eurasian nations, strategist believes that further European integration of the Eastern Partnership countries will deepen their exposure to the rule of law, transparency, accountability, and feel, uh, will facilitate building a knowledge-driven economy, making the Eastern Partnership region a better place to live. Strategist so highly values contribution of the Eastern Partnership Initiative to the region development. And in 2019, Carl Bildt, Prime Minister of Sweden and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden uh, and Radislav Sikorsky, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, Member of European Parliament, have been awarded a Strategist Political Westernization Award for launching Eastern Partnership Initiative. Um, challenges that Eastern Partnership uh, faced during the last year. Last year, the Eastern Partnership went through a kind of crash test. The transition economies of six East European and Caucasus countries were facing significant difficulties caused by lockdowns during the pandemic. The imperfection of the healthcare system in some countries has brought the population to the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe. The war has unfolded between two participants of Eastern Partnership, Armenia and Azerbaijan. The EU countries did not recognize the results of the presidential election and Belarus has downgraded its status in the Eastern Partnership initiative to an expert level. As, um, as uh, the local expert views, thousands of small integration and small partnerships make up the cooperation between the EU and the Eastern Partnership countries in the first place, said the Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt, former, uh, and uh, their various things are discussed in the experts' pieces. Strategists collected their opinions in, on actually, in, in this case, your opinions, in response to all the most significant events of the last year related to the East, 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 European Union and member countries of the Eastern Partnership. We believe these stories will help the representatives of Western institutions 
engaged in the initiative to see the results of their activity from a different angle. Uh, we actually are happy to have a, uh, our experts from all six um, uh, member countries. And uh, the topics that uh, were covered by the experts were the EU COVID-19 microfinancial assistance package for its eastern neighborhood, uh, five long-term goals for the eastern partnership policy, a new common economic space between the EU and the eastern partnership, European Commission has released the Digital Economy and Society Index, and we have discussed this, enhancement of the IT sector in ESA partnership, EU for gender equality program together against gender stereotypes, ESA partnership connect program to reduce the digital divide, and independent media and civil society development. Key trends in 2020 were uh, speaking of prioritized goals of the EU and ESA partnership country cooperation, most experts, experts highlighted the economy and particularly the digital economy. The majority of experts believe that for their countries' economies and primarily for the local IT industries, creating a digital single market in the EU may produce new opportunities which must be taken advantage of. The state structures of the Eastern Partnership countries, according to experts, should make great effort to digitalize public services as well as promote digital literacy to reduce the gap with European partners. It was impossible to identify a common vector in the local uh, of civil society development in the Eastern Partnership countries. On EU assistance to Eastern Partnership countries, in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, most experts suggest that part of it should be directed not to the state of the national level, but to the institutions at the local level. Policy recommendations. The government of the Eastern Partnership countries respond with a varying degrees of enthusiasm to the integration initiatives, such as the creation of a single economic space or integration into a single digital market. In this situation, it makes sense to form a group of advanced Eastern Partnership countries formed out of Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, while remaining within the Eastern Partnership framework. These countries signed association agreements with EU and in May 2021 signed a trilateral memorandum on the start of enhanced cooperation on European integration. Associated trio, when developing new initiatives within the framework of Eastern Partnership, these countries should be offered a deeper level of integration and a greater degree of participation in certain EU projects than other Eastern Partnership countries. At the same time, in order to achieve a balanced involvement among the different Eastern Partnership countries in joint action, it is necessary to develop projects with a regional perspective, aimed to, at civil society institutions of the Eastern Partnership countries. Simultaneous implementation of such projects in all six countries, or in, unfortunately now in five countries, will contribute to the development of relations and mutual adoption of the best practices between civil societies of the Eastern Partnership countries. Having prioritized the digital transformation of the Eastern Partnership countries and their integration into the single digital market, and trust IT specialists and IT companies from the Eastern Partnership countries with the technological implementation of digital, uh, digitalization projects, which will result in the creation of new jobs in the knowledge economy for local youth. During the implementation of any joint projects, curators from the EU should strengthen the requirements of EIP uh, Eastern Partnership member countries to observe inclusiveness in the implementation of these projects. Although there may be legal frameworks in Eastern Partnership countries to protect the rights of socially disadvantaged groups, particularly women, rural communities, and communities impacted uh, by armed conflict. In practice, many of these laws often do not work because of weak state institutions and or cultural characteristics in, of the regions. EU representatives should insist on strict compliance with the rules when implementing joint projects, so that such projects become a model for residents of the EAP countries. Thank you for this, and I'd be happy to, uh, to, to pass the floor back to Praskovia and uh, to uh, discuss the uh, overmentioned uh, issues and uh, subjects with our distinguished experts. Thank you. Thank you, Anatoly. Thank you very much. Uh, the report is from now on available on our website and will be shared with our partners and uh, uh, our audience and those who watch us uh, as the record uh, will have an opportunity to see the report in, in front of them 
while listening to this presentation as well, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, going forward with our presentation, I would like to uh, give a word to the first uh, expert speaker uh, who contributed to, to the analysis. And we'll start with uh, Kaha Gugulashvili, a senior fellow and director of European Studies Center at the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies, Georgia. Mr. Gugulashvili, last year, commencing EU assistance due, during the very beginning of the pandemic, you mentioned that apart from financial assistance, Georgia needs new technologies, know-hows, more investments, assistance in training and education of professionals, and development of industries in the region. Do you still feel that EU should target the economic policy change in Georgia? Has anything changed in Georgia since the beginning of the pandemic in terms of the usage of new technologies? Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, Ms. Bistro, thank you very much, first of all, for um, inviting, for cooperation and uh, for uh, uh, possibility or opportunity to, to speak. Uh, to uh, experts from um, EAP countries and uh, also to your um, organization. Uh, I think that uh, uh, pandemic could not, and it, because of objective reasons, uh, could not, uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was no possibility to, to make any change in EU's policy just uh, EU turned uh, to the urgent assistance to Georgia and the assistance was uh, de uh, dedicated mainly to the sector of health, but also to social assistance uh, uh, and uh, sectors of economy, which, which were important to save. Um, uh, also small businesses and micro businesses to somehow to survive and uh, use assistance which was quite uh, considerable and um, important actually uh, was uh, mainly focused on these issues but no on economic change no on uh, the new developments uh, uh, despite of the fact that there were certain meetings between the government and uh, including uh, association council and uh, association committees and uh, in some other formats, also sectoral cooperation formats, and uh, there were discussions about Georgia's economy and economic future, but no, uh, no important uh, qualitative changes in approaches. And I, I insist on, on my first opinion that I uh, published uh, uh, in, in, your, uh, in, in your edition um, and I think that uh, for Georgia, it is necessary to make a qualitative change in its economic uh, policy, economic uh, status. Uh, uh, for the moment, Georgia, it seems uh, to be uh, in between of the resource economies and uh, the innovative economies. And it's, it's economy which is based on management, actually, the, the main um, uh, driving force uh, of the economic progress is uh, for the moment is uh, uh, the good management but we need to become an economy which uh, driving force is innovation innovation and competitiveness which comes out of innovation so georgia in order to increase its participation its uh, cooperation with the eu its trade uh, integration in EU markets, uh, it needs to, uh, to start developing into a modern, really modern country with modern economy. And first of all, we need good education, we need improvement of uh, 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 expertise, personnel who can understand innovation and who can implement also develop innovation, the innovative technologies and um, uh, only, uh, only in such a way, we our economy can become competitive. Unless there are certain, uh, certain uh, actually facts which shows that uh, despite of uh, signing, uh, uh, it's already six more than six years ago. Yes, only seven years ago actually signing association agreement and uh, uh, the uh, DCFTA provisions entered the force practically immediately after two months after signing in. Uh, June 2014. Uh, despite of that, uh, there is no substantial increase in, in Georgia's exports to EU markets. 
there is some volatility. There is some increase for, uh, for certain years, but uh, there was time in 2014 exactly when uh, the, the level of our experts was practically the same in money values, uh, practically the same uh, as, as it is now. So it means that Georgian goods are not competitive. Uh, there are certain positive things. For example, we extended uh, uh, our um, nomenclature, our uh, the positions which we are exporting to the EU, uh, but still the quantities are not high enough. And recognition of Georgian um, the products also in the EU is not uh, uh, very much working well. So I think, yes, we need innovation and the EU should help us in this. So should is very strong word. I think that uh, kindly uh, could, um, uh, I would say, uh, help us in this. There is no uh, obligation, I think, uh, exactly. But, but there, there are some obligations from association agreement to cooperate with us on innovation, on uh, know-how, technologies. And I think that member states also, different EU member states, should be more active in order to, uh, to in implement uh, this kind of uh, project. I don't want to say that there are no projects of such kind in, uh, in Georgia implementing, for example, GIZ and uh, uh, German uh, foundations. Also, many other countries, EU member states, try to implement such projects, but uh, I think it's not enough. So there should be more focus on transformation of Georgian economy uh, uh, to make it as quickly as possible. Uh, I don't know how, how long time I can speak. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Gagalashvili. Thank you very much. Um, it was just perfect, I think, and I hope uh, this message will be heard. Um, and we all looking forward to see uh, Georgia with the modern economy and uh, with happy people. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. I'll pass the microphone uh, as we continue our Q&A session to Helene Alexanyan, an analyst at Enlight Public Research Center in Geo, Armenia. Helene, uh, commencing the results of the EU's digital economy and uh, society index 2020 and possibility of Armenia to compete with the EU states in terms of ICT sector development. You shared your opinion that Armenia requires adding market-oriented components, such as commercialization of giving projects, adequate project management. While competition with the EU countries is feasible only in the case of finding a unique niche and promoting it. Do you think anything changed throughout the year? Has ICT sector become more advanced due to the lockdown caused by pandemic? Please. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak up and also for question. Uh, definitely each year it's going to be harder and harder for public policymakers to keep up with this uh, pace of digital market development that technologies are dictating us and uh, to which extent we will actually benefit from those transformations will depend also on the administrative and paradigmatic logic synchronization between EU and the IP countries, as well as the decisive will be each country's system uh, capability in terms of effective provision of those benefits. Uh, now coming to Armenia, I first will need to present a little bit the current situation in order, in order to showcase what kind of opportunities and difficulties COVID-19 brought up for us. Uh, for most part of uh, citizens in Armenia, main ICT dividends are visible, are uh, perceptible in two main fields, in public administration area, where the improvement of processes both within in a bureaucracy and in terms of outside relationships between public and private sector as a whole is very much visible, and also in the field of uh, business, with its uh, constant new job creations, uh, competitive uh, rise of competition and also economic growth. Um, I should mention that uh, Armenia has quite a solid list of uh, multinational ICT companies such as Synopsys, uh, Microsoft, uh, Workfront, Optim, Volo and many others uh, operating. However, even they 
with this uh, growing uh, tempo of market, uh, demand more uh, qualified professionals that uh, outstripe the supply. And although we have, uh, for instance, Armad, Tumo Labs that are offering free engineering courses for kids, not uh, mentioning the that the all above mentioned organizations themselves have the uh, trainings for the newcomers and young professionals. These private initiatives are not enough, while the formal education, especially its duration, is not compatible already with the market requirements, and we all will need some systematic solution to this problem. However, it is in this context that COVID-19 have opened new opportunities for us to solve this human resource scarcity problem with uh, lockdowns and uh, remote working force by it. Uh, now, uh, many Ar Armenian ICT companies are uh, 50% of their staff working from home, and this makes this sector more accessible, more inclusive, especially for people with disabilities. And uh, I now currently some Armenian universities and educational centers have launched a programming courses for uh, those people. However, I think that with the EU, we will also need joint initiatives targeted not only on women in, uh, engagement in this field, but also for people, specifically for people with disabilities. And this new hybrid style of working in ICT sector will ease our job. On the other hand, in, the, uh, in terms of the competition with EU countries, COVID-19 have shown one of the main uh, disadvantages Armenian ICT companies actually have, uh, and they should handle this uh, problem. In our uh, response to strategist inquiry, we have mentioned that they will need to find some unique niche where they can uh, actually materialize their advantages in comparison with EU companies. However, uh, at least for this day, the, uh, our Armenian ICT sector fails to correlate with other segments of public life, for example, with health system and uh, the need of developed e-health system. We actually uh, saw during this unfolding pandemic and its severe impact on Armenia, or we can look at the uh, industry, uh, more um, manufacturing industry field, where the limited role of ICT in terms of uh, uh, as a driver for innovation was evidently reflected too. And in this context, Armenian ICT companies will need to adapt more, um, let's say, innovative management practices as well as harmonize uh, their activities with uh, local governmental public policy, but also with EU's key policies in our region as well. And that will be prerequisite for them successful engagement in a wider socio-economic and cultural context that EU's digital society and economy uh, concept are actually suggesting. Uh, so once again, thank you for your question and I hope that we will succeed in this transition to knowledge-based and green economy. Definitely, Helena, I, I second that. And uh, thank you for your contribution and uh, uh, for the updated information today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, my next question would be to Artem Bidenko, head of the Institute of Information Security in Ukraine. Artem, last December, Joseph Borrell, Vice President of the European Commission, announced that uh, the EU's future Eastern Partnership policy based on five areas of resilience, economic, democratic, environmental, digital, and um, societal. According to Mr. Borrell, it is key to empower civil society and independent media to increase accountability, to expose corruption, and to enhance critical thinking. Commenting this, you mentioned that Ukraine is at the beginning of forming an active political culture, a culture of participation. Do you think societal uh, resilience is something more important than, say, economic one? What can be done by the EU to enhance this way of resi resilience, to nurture the culture of participation, please. Hi, thank you as well for the invitation, for taking the floor. Uh, I don't think that uh, any uh, kind of uh, complex system, any 
part of complex system is more important than other parts. So uh, neither societal uh, resilience nor digital resilience nor economic resilience are more important. Uh, all of these uh, kinds of these types of resilience uh, are parts of complex system of society. And we should um, evaluate the development of society in terms of uh, open society, in terms of participation, because uh, the more uh, inclusive society is, the more inclusive these parts are, uh, the more effective the system uh, uh, develops. So uh, I don't think that we should put, uh, for example, societal uh, resilience uh, on the first lane. We should uh, create um, such conditions uh, that all uh, elements of uh, society develop equally. So we should uh, uh, present and develop uh, possibilities for different uh, elements uh, that form society to uh, develop. For example, we should work with uh, private uh, inter entrepreneurship uh, so that economics develops uh, not only with uh, huge uh, entities but also with uh, private, private uh, ideas. We should uh, invest into ecology because ecology is uh, really important today not only for huge companies but also for families. We should uh, invest into digital uh, security and informational security so that people could uh, live uh, uh, in the world which, that is changing very quickly today, especially in COVID times. A lot of uh, disinformation is, uh, is in any country of the world and uh, we should teach people how to live in this world of disinformation because it also influences their lives both uh, social and economical so uh, the role of european union today is uh, as it is in uh, its uh, forming documents to um, uh, to realize freedom of uh, movement, realize the freedom of economics, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, rights of people, and to unite all uh, people into one uh, huge uh, society um, in order to develop uh, its uh, priorities and develop its uh, ideas. So uh, European Union should um, uh, look into uh, helping developing uh, the complex uh, systems uh, that include both uh, social, not only, okay, not both uh, social, economic, uh, informational, uh, cultural, uh, ecological um, ideas, uh, so that um, uh, small societies uh, develop uh, equally and influence large societies like uh, cities, towns or countries uh, develop also equally in this world. That's the answer. Thank you very much, Artem. Um, it's definitely important to underline uh, that most of these issues are, are faced uh, definitely by Ukraine, but also by the region and the whole world. And it's uh, important to understand that this is a common uh, a struggle and it should be a, a definitely a teamwork. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my next uh, question is to Dr. Katerina Bornukova, Academic Director of the Rock Economic Research Center at Belarus. Katerina, commenting the issue of creating possible economic space with the EU, you mentioned last year that uh, the economic integration with the EU is not aimed at Belarus. Moreover, later on, Belarus downgraded its status in the Eastern Partnership to an expert level. And just two days ago, on June 28th, Belarus has suspended its participation in the Eastern Partnership. Do you agree that Belarus has even more distanced itself from certain integration steps with the EU? What alternative path can be found for EU-Belarus cooperation? Please. 
Thank you. Yes, indeed, unfortunately, Belarus has uh, ended its participation in Eastern Partnership just a couple of days ago. Uh, but even before the political crisis, uh, Belarus was viewing the EU, first of all, as the economic partner, and uh, it was not looking to integrate more generally. And, uh, well, yes, it was looking to, for economic integration, because uh, the EU is a very important economic partner. It's um, the partner that provides 30% of exports uh, from Belarus. Uh, it's a very important partner for FDI. Uh, Eurasian or oh, uh, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development is was a huge investor in uh, infrastructural projects uh, in Belarus, and it was largely due to Be Belarus participation in Eastern Partnership. And indeed, though Belarus didn't use all the possibilities of this uh, mechanism, uh, it was interested in the economic part of it before the political crisis. But the problem was that. Even looking just at economics, not at politics, Russia always mattered more. It's a more important experts market, which is much more diversified and more value added. Moreover, we exports, well, the primary export to the EU is petrochemicals that we produce from oil, which is imported from Russia. So the economic dependence on Russia is huge. It's not only limited to trade, it's also FDI, it's financial support of uh, public debt, it's common labor markets, which is very important uh, integration mechanism for Belarus. And that's why even uh, opposition candidates last year, no one uh, spoke about, uh, uh, you know, uh, breaking ties with Russia. And when they spoke about developing ties with the EU, um, they said, of course, preserving uh, the economic union and other types of unions that we have with Russia, because it's very important, again, economically. Uh, and that's why, actually, indeed, Belarus was never looking for the EU accession. It, was never, it has never stated the desire to uh, become the EU member at some point in time. Uh, and I think that's why Belarus was very happy when Armenia actually managed to sign not the standard CFTA agreement, but the agreement which was both compatible with the Eurasian Economic Union. And I think it, it could be, just a year ago, it could be something that Belarus would aspire for. But of course, then the political crisis changed everything because unfortunately the uh, current government preferred to uh, frame the what has started as the, you know, the internal political crisis, to frame it as something which was the attack from the West, and uh, frame again the relationship with the EU in this enemy attack words. Um, and of course, after we see the, we have seen the sectoral sanctions being introduced against Belarus last week, which is something uh, quite unique in both Belarus and the EU history. I don't think that uh, uh, economic relationship or any other kind of relationship with the EU would improve significantly uh, before the political change in Belarus. Uh, now, what could the EU do and the Eastern Partnership Mechanism do? I think what, what the EU does right now is actually the correct way. It continues to support Belarusians. For example, it has said that despite Belarus single-handedly exiting the Eastern Partnership, the EU would still offer all the uh, visa agreements that it has uh, signed with Belarus uh, and continue to support Belarusian people. It continues to support the civil society in Belarus, although it's becoming increasingly more difficult, you know, even to offer uh, support to these organizations because these organizations are repressed. It continues to support the private sector, although again, uh, it's very difficult to do right now. And more importantly, it has offered the support package uh, uh, which is intended to support fin financially Belarus after the political change. I think that was a very important, sub uh, very important uh, signal and I think what lacks is also some commitment to certain form of trade liberalization once the political change happens so that we actually see uh, well first of all the sanctions lifted automatically once we see some political uh, 
transfer in Belarus. And then also some forms of trade liberalization and maybe some agreement to, to, to look for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katarina, for um, updating us and for giving your uh, expert perspective. Thank you. My next question is to uh, Shala Ismail, Chairwoman at Women's Association for Rational Development, Azerbaijan. Um, Mrs. Ismail, in July 2020, UN Women and UNFPA, together with the European Union, have launched a three-year regional program to tackle gender stereotypes and gender-based violence in six countries of the Eastern Partnership. Commenting this last year, you mentioned that women continue facing gender-based restrictions deeply rooted in traditional social norms in Azerbaijan. Has the situation become any better with the transition to remote work during pandemic? And do you believe digitalization of business processes can become a game changer in gender equality issues? Please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be sharing this panel. And this is indeed a very good question because Azerbaijan, as uh, many countries in the world and also in the Eastern Partnership, still continue facing the I would even say countless uh, gender-related stereotypes and, and challenges in their daily life, in, in the household uh, scale, but also at the uh, state uh, and societal scale. Uh, the thing is that uh, generally uh, women's rights in Azerbaijan is quite a debatable topic on its own. On one hand, we are having quite modern indicators of women's development. On the other hand, we are still having very uh, deeply rooted gender biases and gender street gender roles which unfortunately prevent women's uh, participation, women's um, growth, um, it, both in the career level, but also in the education and generally. Uh, we are also having a lot of um, new types of female disadvantages, such as early marriages, sex selective abortions, trafficking women, etc. All these does not put us in a very good picture of reality when it comes to gender equality and women's rights. Yet indeed, as you correctly mentioned, um, the this um, sort of transition, digital transition, should and may have led to a certain uh, jump uh, forward. Uh, however, I strongly believe that uh, no matter what situation we are living and what sort of global trends we are living through, uh, much depends on what is the ad hoc situation inside a country. If for decades we are experiencing the challenges with good governance and with, uh, you know, with the problems in, in terms of corruption, with the com com problems in terms of democratic, lack of democratic reforms, then nothing changes when it comes to digitalization because in order to fully benefit from digital world and, and those opportunities which this new era brings to us, we have to ensure first that the good governance is in place with the rule of law being um, as a, a you know, primary objective and um, you know, any other things which I've already mentioned. So with this in mind, uh, I would like to answer your question that the, there is not one uh, answer to your question because the situation is not monotonous. It always has this twofold uh, perspective. And our organization has done last year the assessment uh, on um, COVID-19 and its p impact on women's rights situation in Azerbaijan. Uh, the findings of which we will share very shortly, like in a month's time probably, and will be available on our website, both in Azerbaijan and English language. Uh, but the findings in itself, uh, it brought us to the general conclusion that um, 19, um, you know, it would happen in 19 and 20, it brought us uh, not forward, but behind when it comes to women's rights situation, because again, there is twofold approach. On one side, women are ha having and was were having um, quite an aggressive escalation of their household responsibilities and they had to do a lot of things in parallel and very often they had to postpone their education plans and career plans just because they were trapped in their household commitments 
uh, because of the unfair gender roles, which I earlier mentioned. On the other side, if these things are more or less balanced in their family, women had the extra opportunity to be more inclusive in the education plan. So this is why much depends on also on specific sector. But since I'm in the NGO sector and I've been tracking uh, the uh, situation of the civil society in Azerbaijan for years now, I would also like to mention using the opportunity the very grave situation of the civil society in Azerbaijan for more than seven years. And um, in early 2014, the civil society of Azerbaijan had um, had faced the unprecedented crackdown uh, with the change of legislation, with the change of uh, organizational and financial uh, viabilities, uh, etc. So we had a very big, uh, uh, you know, pressure from the side of the government and the entire landscape and enabling environment has changed to a very hard circumstances for the civil society. In the time when it happened, there were more than 4,000 registered NGOs in Azerbaijan. There were also uh, about 2,000 unregistered NGOs by that time. But out of the entire figure, it was less than 200 women's rights organiza organizations, which basically means that uh, from the entire NGO sector, there were less than 5% of women's rights organizations which were dealing with these gender-based, uh, gender-related issues. Uh, now seven years later there is no uh, exact figure unfortunately because um, this data is not accessible but from what we observed and from some fragmentary assessments it's already visible that less than one-fifth of the organizations um, survived and survived does not necessarily mean operational so one fifth if we put the same scale to the women's rights NGOs that would make less than 40 and I'm very generous with this figure also less than 40 women's rights organizations who are able to be uh, are able to work on women's rights um, issues so with that in mind uh, if we put it translated into the functionality and effectiveness of the women's rights agenda in azerbaijan i would say that the situation is rather grave i mean uh, rather gray i would even say close to black in the in the meaning that uh, these organizations turned out to be in the situation when they can hardly protect themselves let let them um, let alone you know defending the rights of their constituencies so uh, this is just yet another demonstration to what extent we are trapped in this situation and if i am to to pick up one issue in our country because definitely uh, the situation is not um, you know similar i mean there are a lot of common things of course in all our countries of eastern partnership but there are also very specific contexts and back to your question regarding the three-year project of eu for gender that's very very well welcome, of course, but they shouldn't be used um, and couldn't be, of course, used the similar approach to all the six countries because we are having different status with uh, our democratic pr perspectives, with our realities, etc. Uh, so in this regards, I would say that uh, Azerbaijan is in a very special situation not just as a post-COVID trauma as such, and it's even not post-COVID, we are still living through it, and um, the danger and the risk of another lockdowns and the third and fourth waves are still there. But also, um, you correctly mentioned that uh, we are having this uh, special situation with Nagorno Karabakh war, the second war which was uh, last year, and by the way, which also affected the uh, internet capacity because of the natural law, we were completely disconnected from the internet. But also a number of other occasions, for example, the OJP, Azerbaijan status as OJP remains um, silent, remains, uh, remains um, um, you know, a very special position for three years. We are a silent member of OJP and the time for implementing action plan of Azerbaijan at OJP expires this August. And a uh, number one issue, what the government was supposed to do was to improve the situation with the civil society. So shortly saying, uh, the answer is can never be um, said yes or no. There's definitely a lot of opportunities uh, taking into account 
the common trends and, and global trends, but yet we are so much tied to the realities uh, dealt with the good governance uh, scenario in Azerbaijan and all the consequences related to that, that we can have both ends. We can have very negative perspectives and very positive perspectives, depending on what scenario our government and further uh, supportive sectors choose. I have a lot to say, uh, but I'm open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shala. Thank you for your perspective and uh, update. And we're looking forward to see uh, to see the report, the new analysis your organization made. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have uh, questions from the audience at this point. Uh, and uh, But I hope there are questions in the minds of those who watch this video, definitely. And uh, uh, just uh, finalizing this, um, this, this presentation, this discussion, I would like to ask Anatoly Motkin, President of Strategies, to, uh, to give some uh, final uh, remarks on, the, on the, today's presentation and the report. Hey, thank you, thank you, Brasco, and thank you uh, to our experts. And I think that the Eastern Partnership, uh, above all, it's not only about the uh, economic uh, integration, as has been mentioned and was perceived by some of the governments, but it's also about values. And it's also not uh, necessarily only about uh, integration between the Eastern Partnership countries, I think so, uh, with the e European Union, but also about regional integration. And uh, I hope that those conflicts that have been uh, be between uh, some of the countries uh, will be uh, resolved eventually. But I think that uh, the, the inclusivity, the uh, equal opportunities are so important that uh, I, I think that uh, those countries who participate in this program and hopefully also Belarus will get back uh, to, to this initiative at some stage, uh, will assist to each other uh, to get to one European uh, family. And uh, I think that uh, this initiative that was promoted by Mr. Sikorsky and Mr. Bild is uh, extremely important also to get separate attention uh, to those countries who are uh, historically part of a uh, European family of nations. So thank you so much to, uh, for your uh, uh, inputs and for your uh, involvement in, in this uh, project of uh, trying to analyze and to, to, prom uh, to provide some uh, policy recommendations also to European decision makers because sometimes and many times from uh, this region some things are uh, perceived much more clearly uh, than uh, from Brussels. Thank you so much. Thank you very much Anatoly. I would also like to um, thank our distinguished panel for the contribution to the report and willingness to share your your opinion and perspective today uh, during this live session. I would also like to thank our audience who joined us uh, with Zoom format and uh, via live on Facebook and those who watched the presentation as a record. Um, thank you for your time and interest and uh, the report is now available on our website and will be shared uh, within the network and our partners. And uh, yep, thank you dear all, have a great rest of the day and we stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.